Well, in any case, I'm going to ho hopefully talk to you today about this gradual evolution in uh, bioinformatics research. And it's really going to be, of course, focused on the research in my lab. And so I thought I would start off and uh, with really the most important um, slide in this presentation, of course, is the acknowledgments, because obviously what I'm going to be talking to you about today is not stuff I've done myself, but it's really done by many, many people that have uh, come through my lab over the years. And actually this slide turned out to be by far the most difficult slide for me to put together for this presentation because to make a nice presentation, of course, um, you have to pick out um, some specific individuals and specific stories from the many people and leave many things out. Um, oops. So I've highlighted a few um, individuals that I'm gonna kind of highlight what they've done a little bit in the past and also in the uh, present, uh, just to give you a sense of the type of uh, research we've done over the years. And then um, I'm gonna go on a bit and um, talk to you a little bit about the future. So the outline for my talk is sort of shown here where, let me see, where, well, we have to make sure we got the mouse here. Oops, uh, is that thing working? Oh dear. Ah. There we go. Um, so in any case, I'm gonna start off with a little background of what we've worked on in the past, you know, working on structures and simulations and uh, networks as it was so well described by, in the introduction. And then a little bit about what we're doing now, uh, doing a little bit of stuff related to that, uh, looking at a lot of genomic modeling and so forth. And then sort of thinking about where we'd like to go in the future and you know, where the whole field is um, potentially going. And, uh, you can maybe can guess where this 2052 is coming from, but I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, so first of all, I wanted to start off with my first association with ISMB. And this is actually, um, well, I guess the answer to one of the questions that was <laughs> posed before my talk when the first ISMB was. Well, it turned out um, in the second one, um, I, I gave a talk and this was um, work with Russ Altman at uh, Stanford University. I was just finishing my um, graduate studies and starting as a postdoc. And this was work that we did uh, working on um, simulating um, protein structures and looking at their uh, flexibility. And this is the type of stuff I initially did. And I was very excited to be in this uh, community of people. And when I first got to Yale, I started working on the same type of thing. And I was really interested in looking at um, the motion of molecules on a very large scale. And I tried to make this database of macromolecular motions. Um, and this was work that was um, done by some really great graduate students I had initially, in particular Werner Krebs and Sam Flores. Um, and we did a lot of simulation work and so forth. But what, I always had this nagging question of, you know, where was this work gonna go? And I was really worried because I had worked with so many truly brilliant people in the world of protein structure and protein structure prediction. And frankly, it was like the holy grail. They never got to the end. You know, they tried so hard, of course, to fold the protein and to predict the um, structure of the protein from the sequence, but they failed. And you know, I said to myself, Jesus, this is just way too hard for me. And so I kind of guessed I should kind of move out of that. And of course, I was wrong <laughs> because now, of course, in 2023, we have AlphaFold, which is really a miracle. And it's amazing to see that, particularly after these early years when it was so difficult uh, to uh, deal with protein structure. Oops, oops. Um, <laughs> but in any case, I, I decided to transition uh, out of structures. And so what, what did I do? Well, the first thing I kind of got into was um, network science. And network science was, I think, kind of an early version of data science. This is around 2000 or so. And this is um, just the idea, which we still have now, that we can represent many things in network structures. So for instance, we can, of course, look at um, neural networks, social networks, molecular networks, as we're very accustomed to, but other things, food, web, and so forth. And this, I think a lot of these network ideas were really popularized by um, Barabasi, who's really a brilliant um, network scientist. And this is his book here, he's linked, which really talks about this unifying idea of networks. And I really was excited by this. So I kind of got into it. And one of the things that um, people were really interested in networks initially, and Barabasi in particular, was that most natural networks 
have what's called the scale-free structure. So if you look at them, and you look at what's called their degree distribution, it doesn't look like a random network. It kind of has this long tail to it. And that long tail, of course, represents hubs, highly connected parts of the network. And one of the things that people discovered um, initially, and we, we were one of the people participating, in particular one of my really great students, Hai Wan Yu, was that the center points in a lot of biological networks tended to be more conserved, more constrained, sort of obvious. But you know, a lot of people found this in many, many different contexts, and we found this to be a very interesting thing. And then kind of I went on, and with a, another really great um, scientist, Philip Kim, we said to ourselves, well, we're so interested in structures, we like these networks, what is what does a, a protein network really look like if you instantiate its molecular structure? So, you know, at the time, we said we, we, would, we would build up the protein interactome in terms of 3D structures by taking um, sort of uh, complexes of protein molecules together. And so we built what we called the structural interactome. And this had a really neat characteristic because we found out that the hubs in the structural interactome kind of broke into two groups. There was one which we called the multi-interface hubs, and this is what you kind of might expect where you have many proteins docking around a central protein using many different interfaces. But there was also what we called single interface hubs, where you had many proteins, but they not at the same time would dock against one protein at the same interface, so they couldn't simultaneously occupy that interface. And it turned out when you looked at the conservation properties of these, um, these types of hubs, they were very different. The multi-interface hubs the, you know, sort of behaved as hubs you might expect. They were very conserved and so forth, but that's not true for the single interface hubs. These actually tended to evolve very quickly, and this was an interesting paradox we kind of got into at the time. So what were we also excited by? Well, while we were looking at the proteome, we of course got very excited by the genome. So late 1990s, early 2000s, big excitement for the sequencing of the first um, bacterial, and then eukaryotic, and then eventually the human genome. And this was tremendously exciting at the time for just everyone. And I wasn't really a participant in this, but I was watching the excitement. And in 1998, I was so excited by this, I, I made this slide, I made this slide in 1998. And at, on this slide, I said, okay, well, here's the first bacterial genome, it was in science. First eukaryote, it's in nature. Here's the first animal, or metazoan, it was in science. And I said, okay, well, when they finish the human genome, it's gonna be soon. It, it's gonna be beyond science and nature, and they're gonna put the cover, they're gonna put it on the cover of like Time or Newsweek. And so I made up this cover. This is before Dolly, you know, you know, stable diffusion and all that. I made this up in Photoshop. This is a prediction. And I was so happy because this is this was a prediction that worked. Two years later, this was the cover of Newsweek. And you know, there you are, a prediction that was sort of true. Um, and so I kind of got very into the, the genome at the time, and I was very lucky because I had this incredible uh, colleague at Yale at the time, Mike Snyder, who was one of the developers of the chip-chip and then chip-seq technique for uh, basically mapping where transcription factors bound on DNA. And so working with him and working with a lot of others, we really got into looking at the regulatory network. And what we would do is we would take these binding sites for transcription factors on the genome, and then we would figure out, of course, which transcription factor bound there, and we would associate those sites with genes. Yeah, maybe the nearby gene, of course, you can get more sophisticated on this, but the simple picture, of course, is you can make a regulatory network. And we were very interested because we could take these regulatory networks and kind of unfold them into hierarchies where we had the TFs that tended to do more regulation have a higher out degree at the top and the ones that were more regulated at the bottom. And so here's just the transcription factors in the human network. This is 100 or so factors from, say, circa 2010. And it made a nice hierarchy. And we were very into the fact that these hierarchies um, they had lots of neat um, aspects. So for instance, you could see the factors at the top tended to drive gene expression more, more strongly than the factors at the bottom. You could also see that the factors at the top were better connected you know, into other networks like the protein interaction network. And as you might expect from what I've said, you can also see that the factors at the top tend to be more conserved. They had fewer human variants in them. 
So we were very excited by all these network properties we could see in the human um, regulatory network. And one thing that we really got into is comparing the human regulatory network to other networks. Now, of course, we can compare them to other biological networks, but it's very useful to actually compare them to very different type of networks to get good intuition on their properties. And one of my favorite network comparisons was done by this brilliant postdoc, Kun Kyu Yan, who compared the biological regulatory network, which is kind of like the network of our biological operating system, to the network instantiated by a computer operating system. This was called the Linux call graph network. So you probably know Linux is this free operating system that was around quite a while ago. And as it runs, it instantiates a network. This is the call graph network of one routine calling another, which calls another, and so forth. And if you unfold this network, you get a picture that looks like this. And distinctively, this network, it looks very different from the regulatory network, and it has very few things at the bottom and lots of things at the top. And that's because if you think about how we tend to program computers, there's a small group of routines, like memory handling routines, printing routines, that we tend to call constantly. And there's many more master control programs. Whereas in the biological network, it's kind of inverted. There's fewer master control regulators at the top and more things at the bottom. Okay, interesting. Um, one thing we also found, which was really neat, was we started to look at you know, that, that idea of sort of connectivity related to constraint. So here's just a picture of that for a human network, okay, where we have an inverse relationship. The more central you are in the network, the more constrained you are, the less mutations you have, okay? And what we found, which was really bizarre, was that in the man-made Linux network, it was the opposite. The more connected you were in the network, in the call graph structure, the more mutations and changes you had. Now, you might ask, well, how do we get mutations and changes in the call graph structure? Well, the really neat thing about Linux, of course, is you can download its whole evolution from the beginning, and you can look at the number of changes there were in each um, subroutine, right, or each routine. And then you can just tabulate them, just like SNP density, and so you can make this type of graph, and it has the opposite structure. And we've been very interested in this, and you know, lo and behold, we, we repeated this calculation about 10 years later, ver fairly recently on the R package network, which also has a similar positive relationship. And you might say, well, how, how can this be? But you can get very good intuition for this. So the intuition is that in a biological network, you do not want to make changes in the hubs because those are going to disrupt the network. They might kill the organisms. So you tend to get um, greater conservation in the hubs. Conversely, think about a man-made network, a designed network. In this type of structure, you believe, the designer believes that they can make a change without killing the organism or the system. And because of that, they're liable to make changes where they're most useful. So they're gonna make the changes now in the hubs because the hubs are more used. And so if you think about the road network, right? You never see lots of construction in South Dakota. I hope I'm not offending anyone here. But you see lots of construction, say, on a major thoroughfare, like the George Washington Bridge, which is one of the big thoroughfares on the East Coast. Tremendous construction. Why is that? The designers believe they can make the changes without disrupting or killing the network. So very different structure for designed versus biologically evolved networks. Okay, so that's, that was our segue into, I'm sorry, that's our, that's our segue into genomics. And then we kind of got more into it. And so we started at the time also just thinking about you know, modeling the genome. This is early days, you know, like 2008 or so, 2000, 2009. And we started to think about simple models for just relating what's happening at the promoter to relating what's happening at the genes. And we could say, look at the amount of a particular histomark or a particular transcription factor, maybe some were positively correlated, some were negatively correlated and so forth. We, we tried making up little simple linear models. Eh, linear models didn't work so well, but it turned out that you could actually make up with some fairly straightforward machine learning techniques to support vector regression, much more simpler than the deep learning stuff people are doing now and all. You could make up pretty, pretty good models. So here's a model that was done for the worm genome where we're looking at many different histomarks and we're looking at bins around the TSS. And th this just shows how each of those marks is correlated with the overall expression. And if you put them all together, you can get pretty good um, 
correlation. This is from the ENCODE, um, the big ENCODE paper in 2012. And this one had, you see, an R of 0.9. That's pretty good. You know, for bioinformatics predictions, 0.9 is pretty good. And of course, people have subsequently went on, done much better work on this. But I, I think this was nice early days work. And I should really acknowledge that Martin Vingren really did, at the same time, a lot of this very early work on these type of uh, predictive models. And one thing I got very excited by <laughs> in terms of these models was we went on, we were doing models, you know, human genome, we also looked at a lot of model organism genomes, and you know, we could get a good predictive model in each. So if we trained a model in human, we could yeah, get, say this is an R of 0.82, and in human if we did a model on a worm, we did eh, relatively well, 0.74, fly model, and fly, and so forth. But then we, we said, okay, what if we took the human model with the human parameters and applied it to the worm? It didn't do as well, but it still actually did reasonably well. And we realized we could actually make up a, kind of universal model with one set of parameters that would work cross phyla across these hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And I was really impressed that you could make this model up that would work uh, 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 over such great evolutionary divergences. So in any case, we're, we're, we got into modeling on the genome and then we did a little bit more modeling. Oops, I went a little fast there. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we got into neurogenomics, and this is, you know, 2015 or so, looking at the brain. And here we got into modeling not so much the output of a gene, but sort of the overall traits in organisms. So we tried to start making models for, say, predicting if you have schizophrenia or various neuropsychiatric diseases from looking at the genotype. And we, we the, Jonathan Worrell was a great, um, great scientist lab, he started making these deep learning models up. And one of the really cool things about these deep learning models that we made up was we were actually able at the bottom of the deep learning model to um, embed the connectivity from the regulatory network. So here, in this particular deep learning architecture, the nodes in this, the deep learning model actually represented the genes in the um, regulatory network and likewise the connections between the nodes represented uh, various regulatory connections. And therefore, what we could do in these models is when we looked at how well they did on trait prediction, they would do relatively well, but more importantly, you could see which parts of the model were highly weighted. So which genes were particularly weighted, and you could see that a lot of these genes that were highly weighted were say, genes associated with the trait, like say GRIN1 for schizophrenia. But you would also see, which was kind of cool, um, other genes that maybe could be useful drug targets. And we did these models on a whole variety of diseases and whatnot that I think that were quite useful. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of past context. So that gets us to 2018. That was what I just showed you about five years ago. And now I'm gonna show you, we're still doing models, we're still doing things like that, and I'm gonna show you kind of contemporary work. This is done, um, by people currently in the lab. And this is work on what's called the NTEX resource. And the NTEX resource is a, it's a big collaboration actually between ENCODE, and that's the N, and GTEX, the TEX. And uh, what happens here is it makes a beautiful data set. You should all go and download this. I can't tell you, it's beautiful. It's got um, uh, four individuals from GTEX, right? And you've got all the GTEX tissues, okay? But then they've done all the ENCODE chromatin assays on them, you know, all the histone marks, a lot of TF chip and all that stuff on these. And in addition, they have long read whole genome sequencing, okay? So we, uh, so we can, you know, find 20,000 or more structural variants in each of these genomes, and we can build up diploid personal genomes for each of the individuals, diploid, and I'm going to get to that, where we can see the maternal and paternal genomes of each of the people. Now, when we can build up diploid genomes for people, we, we can kind of approach the functional genomics analysis a little differently. So we can look, for instance, at any given functional genome experiment. Say we have an, R, um, an RNA-seq or a chip-seq experiment. We can actually take the reads from them and map them back uniquely to either the paternal or the maternal copy, okay? And then we can see if there's more coming from, say, the maternal copy than the paternal copy, or they're equal. If they're equal, we call it an allele balance locus, say, in relation to expression or binding. But if it's unequal, we call it an allele imbalanced or allele-specific locus, okay? And this is quite, um, quite useful because we can see very, this very balanced experiment between the two chromosomes each of us carries. And so, of course, we have a pipe, oop, there we go. We, we have a, um, 
we have a pipeline to, to do all this allele work and we call it allele seek. Um, and you know, getting a little bit more technical, this pipeline looks at all the heterozygous variants in the genome and looks, you know, the, the, in the diploid uh, genome and looks at the number, the, the height of the read stack for the maternal versus the paternal copy. And then of course it has to do some sort of test, uh, statistical as a beta binomial test to um, identify those sites that are significantly imbalanced. And I should say there's a lot of really technical tricky bits to this that I'm not going to go into that have to do with how the reads map and so forth. When you deal with the personal genomes, it's, it's kind of a better way to do it, but you still have, there's a lot of, because the sequences are so close, you have to be very careful of how the, the mapping is done for the, for the reads. And then of course we can also do the calculations not at a particular locus, but over an entire element and aggregate all the reads over an element which has a number of variants to call an allele specific element. And I use the term AS uh, throughout this talk for allele specific. Now, if you take one assay in one individual in one tissue, say, uh, H3K27 acetylation, and then one individual, individual one spleen, you get maybe 2,000 or 3,000 allele-specific variants. Now, what you can also do is you can look at all the tissues in the individual. So you can pool all those allele-specific variants. So there's different ways of doing the pooling. You can just kind of union all the variants you get from all the tissues, but you could also pool all the reads together from all the tissues and do a form of joint calling. And it turns out that if you do the joint calling, it's very important because you get about five times as much power to determine allele-specific events because you're aggregating so many reads together, okay? And then you can also do a type of pooling across the individuals and um, across the assays, and in total, when you do that, you arrive at what we call the AS or allele specific catalog, which has about 1.3 million allele specific variants in the genome. And this is the biggest catalog of allele specific events people had come up with. And it's, it's useful for all sorts of things I'm going to show you uh, now. So, one thing in particular, you can find lots of allele specific elements in the genome. And these allele specific elements are highly enriched in EQTLs, but also in the in GWAS loci. So for instance, if you take a look at all the regulatory elements that say ENCODE found, which is about a million in the genome at the time, okay? And you look at the number of allele-specific elements that are active in a particular tissue, it's much smaller. It's only about 3,000. So you have a 300-fold enrichment in terms of finding the, the elements where your disease variant may be set. So that's a useful thing ahead of time. Um, the other thing you can, of course, do is you can use these allele-specific variants to disentangle a specific locus. So here's a famous, well-known locus, the H19 IGF2 locus. Lots of people know. Classic story, you know, on the paternal chromosome, IGF2 is on. On the maternal chromosome, H19 is on. And this has to do with um, CTCF binding between them. You can build these allele-specific signal tracks for both the paternal and maternal. You can see that. But what's really cool here is because we have so many assays, we can take, we can take take the high c experiment and describe that in allele-specific terms. And we can get allele-specific chromatin structure. And you can actually see this allele-specific activity is a consequence of very different chromatin structures uh, for the maternal and paternal haplotypes. Okay, so that's, ooh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's building this allele catalog and kind of building this resource. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did with it. And, and I'm going to talk to you about kind of modeling this allele specific activity. So the first thing that we did is we, we have this big catalog of allele specific variants. And right off, we said to ourselves, well, what are they associated with? And well, you can obviously look if a lot of these allele specific variants are associated with particular types of transcription factor binding, or are they in the motifs for a particular type of transcription factor? And you can see, are they enriched um, for a particular factor or not? And lo and behold, um, there's a lot of enrichment. So you can, you can rank all the transcription factors in terms of how enriched they are in allele-specific variants in relation to different assays. And you can see, for instance, some, um, some factors like FOXO3 are very enriched in allelic events, whereas others like DLX5 are not. And we call these 
um, sites, the, the fact, the sites for a particular factor that are very enriched in allelic variants, sensitive sites and sensitive TFs. And I'm going to come back to this term over and over. And then we found that we can actually take these sensitive sites and use them now to really understand and model the connection between the promoter and the, uh, the output of the gene. But now we're not going to look at just how correlated the promoter is, the activity in the promoter is to the target gene. We're going to look at how correlated the allele-specific activity is in the promoter to the target gene. So we could, of course, just look, for instance, at can we predict allele-specific activity in the target gene from allele-specific activity in the promoter or vice versa? We can do that. And here's the results of a simple model doing that. Yes, allele-specific activity in the target gene, say, will predict allele-specific activity in the promoter. But what's interesting is when you make a model, you get a very successful model for this prediction. But the most important feature is not allele-specific activity in, the, in, for instance, the target gene. It's the presence of these sensitive motifs um, sitting on an SNV in the promoter. So if you have an allele-specific gene and you're trying to predict if the promoter is allele-specific, the most important feature is do you have a sensitive motif with an SNV in the promoter? Why is that? Well, we started to think about that. And what we did is we said, well, maybe we can try to understand what gives rise to allele-specific activity. So we took one transcription factor, CTCF, which we had a lot of data for, and we said, okay, let's think about what this looks like. Imagine you have CTCF motifs on the genome, and you have an allelic variant here, and the allelic variant hits the CTCF motif. So here's a CTCF motif, and here's a conserved part of that motif, and one of the allelic variants knocks out that conserved nucleotide. Well, it makes sense that you might get allele-specific binding. And so we made a simple model for that, and the model does not work at all. AUC point, you know, 0.05, it, it doesn't, or 0.5, it does not work. So then we said, well, maybe we don't know exactly the positioning of the CTCF and the allelic site. It's not, there's something a little funky going on. So we said, we'll let the CTCI, CTCF site move around a bit, and we got a little bit more predictive performance. You see it popped up a little bit by opening the window a little, a little bit. But lo and behold, what we found which we've surprised us very much, is when we took one of these new transform models, the sort of um, DNA BERT model, and we sort of specialized it to allelic effects, we could get really successful predictions, like shockingly successful, you know, way above AUC of 0.7, so using just the sequence. So the idea here is we take the sequence um, and a big window of the sequence, and we can predict if a SNP is, or if a site is going to be sensitive to a mutation there, it's going to give rise to an allelic activity or not, just from looking at the sequence. We have to use a very big sequence window. Now, again, why is that? Why can we do so well with a big window, whereas we weren't able to do well with a sort of more focused prediction? Well, we can think about this a little bit, because as you all know, these transform models have this attribute of attention. So they show you uh, in the model what nucleotides they're paying attention to. So here's a particular site on the genome, and here's the CTCF, and here's the attention that the model is posing. Of course, it gives a lot of attention to the CTCF, we might expect. But notice it's also putting a lot of attention here, a lot of attention here, and a lot of attention here. And the attention is going on the motifs of other factors. There's other transcription factors that are really important in terms of whether this CTCF is going to bind in allelic fashion or not. And this is for, of course, one spot in the genome. We can, of course, aggregate these over all the different sites, and we can find that a lot of the motif profiles match the attention profiles. And then what's most important is we have we came up with the rationalization for this, and I call this the lunar lander rationalization. And I think it makes sense. <laughs> the idea basically is think about if you're a TF and you have and you don't oligomerize or heterooligomerize with any other TFs, and you dock down on the genome. Well, you're going to be pretty sensitive if your one landing site has an SNV. You know, it's, it's not going to dock the same on the two chromosomes. But imagine you're a TF and you're part of this big complex and you're heterooligomerizing with many other factors. So when you dock down the genome, there are many other legs that are holding you in place. You don't care if your foot now hits a rock and there's, there's a variant in that spot. 
Ergo, the sensitive TFs are the ones that don't heteroligamerize. Those are the ones that don't have any support from other TFs to stabilize their binding. Our thought on what gives rise to allosylvic activity. Okay, so that's NTEX 2023. Now let's go into the future. So um, I've gotten interested of late. Where, where are we all going? Okay, you know, in, into the future. Um, well, you know, I'm very excited, of course, by genomics, but I'm also really excited by this concept of biomedical data science, just all that big data around us from many different sources. And I find the fusion of all that data just exciting and very interesting. And one way I think we can think about the big data that we're going to see, of course, is we have all the omics data and all the sort of phenotype data or all the, for instance, the imaging data, the health records data, the wearable data, we can think about, on one hand, we have the molecular data from the omics. On the other hand, we have a lot of data that talks about the, the whole organism and so forth. And so one type of large-scale calculation we can think about more and more is these genotype-phenotype correlations, but with very large-scale data on both sides. And I'm very excited by this. And I think about, well, what are the limitations as we go into the future for this? Well, the truth is, I don't think there's going to be a lot of, you know, real limitations in, term, in terms of getting more genotypes. It is trivial, as you all know, to sequence more genomes. The big issue, of course, is getting consent, getting people to willingly donate their genomes so we can do very large statistics on them. And to get that consent, we really have to think very hard about these notions of privacy, which I'm going to talk about in a second. The other thing that I think is very important is to define the phenotype better. So if we want to do really good correlations between the genotype and the phenotype, the genotype is perfectly defined. It's digital data. The phenotype, mm, sometimes very mushy. But now I think there's all sorts of ideas of making digital phenotypes up from, say, you know, looking at these sensor data and wearable data and so forth. And so we've gotten very into that. And I just sort of have a quick shout out for this type of little work we were doing where we're looking at a lot of the sensor data, you know, the sensor data can be the whole organism, an organ, or you can have chemical data, like the amount of glucose. And one of the things you, the very noisy data, and one of the things you want to do with this data is you want to see if a particular intervention changes it. And, you know, it might sound like an easy thing to do, but it's actually very tricky because there's a lot of different covariates. You know, for instance, if you're looking at a person, you might look at the time of day, what they've eaten, you know, even the time of the year and so forth. In any case, we've developed some Bayesian modeling framework, which I won't go into great detail, but we're very excited about this type of thing going into the future. And then the other thing that we've kind of gotten into is, was alluded to in the introduction, is this notion of privacy. And privacy is a very important thing. I think we, you know, we didn't think about this in the early days of biomedical data science as much, but now I think it's just front and center so important for our discipline. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, privacy, it's not a big deal. You know, we deal with privacy all the time. You know, you want your email to be private. You want your credit card transactions to be private. But I really do think genomic data and biomedical data, but particularly genomic data, is really different stuff. I mean, genome is immutable, right? You can change it. You can, you know, if you get your credit card hacked or something, you get a new credit card. You cannot get a new genome. Also, you know, you pass your genome on to your kids. You can't find, you know, that's it. You know, you're making a decision now if your genome, you put it out to the world about your kids. Ah, that's something you want to think about a little bit. And you might not understand very much about your genome now, but 50 years from now, your kids, you know, I mean, they might, people might know a lot more about the genome. So it's, it's a different thing. And, and you also know that, you know, genomics has had a very fraught history, you know, in the past with all sorts of owning data and so forth. Here's a you know, picture from New York Times of Henrietta Lacks, and you probably all know these stories. And so we have to be very careful about this stuff. And, um, you know, that makes us very cautious, and it makes us not want to share data. But the, the problem is, and this is the conundrum we all face, is that we get power from sharing of data. And I'm not talking about political power here. I'm talking about measurable statistical power. If you can aggregate a million genomes versus aggregating a thousand, you can measure how much more power you get and you get a lot more power. And it's good to do that. And that's what really powers medical research. So we have to figure a way of protecting people's privacy well, but also allowing these large scale studies. And so I've gotten very interested in this and I've worked on a lot of work on this for many years with Dove Greenbaum, who's a really talented um, 
student of mine, he subsequently became a lawyer too, so he knows all about the lawyers. And I should acknowledge Bonnie Berger, you know, I, I know done a lot with ISME, she's done a lot with this field too, and about talking about a lot of the privacy challenges that we have in genomics. Now I'm not gonna, ooh, I'm not gonna, ooh, I'm not gonna talk to you in detail. Sorry about that. I, I'm used to the Mac, you know, and now I'm the Windows. Ooh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. It's awful. It's terrible. So I'm not gonna tell you in detail about the, um, uh, you know, pr privacy challenges that we've we've looked into, but just a little tiny bit, with some very talented uh, postdocs of mine, in particular Arif Harmanchi, we started thinking about well, you know, a lot of times the leakage of information you have from very large scale biomedical data sets, particularly genomic data, sets, is much more subtle than you might realize. So you know, you have a you have a coffee cup that someone has a little saliva on. You can't genotype that person from the coffee cup. It's not going to work. However. You can get a dirty genotype from that coffee cup that's useful for something. And it turns out you can take that dirty genotype you get from the coffee cup and you can link it to a dirty genotype that you might get from a little bit of functional genomics experiments. And if the functional genomics experiments have some sensitive phenotype information linked to them, say a person's HIV status, cancer status, and so forth, you might be able to link the person who held the coffee cup with the with some private information. Nah, not too good to do that. So we have to think about that. And you know, with a really talented postdoc, Gamzi Gerza, in my lab, we start, we thought about this a lot. And we thought, well, maybe there's a way when we do this linking, we prioritize certain SNPs. Like we know rare SNPs count a lot, and you can certainly see cer some SNPs are much more predictive. And so we got into this idea of maybe we could sanitize a lot of genomic files by selectively removing certain SNPs, but not r really hurting their utility in a lot of, a lot of um, calculations. And so we came up with this idea of a kind of sanitized BAM file, where you would take the most um, sort of, um, I should say, individual variants, you'd push them off into this encrypted diff file, and then you would have this public PBAM file. In any case, uh, our ideas for the future. Okay, so now a little bit more where we're going. So that's kind of new directions for me now, but let's, let's think about ISMD 2052. So where did I come up with that number? Well, I was there, you know, I guess 29 years ago in ISMD 94. And when we want to think to the future, where, where are we going to be in equal time into the future? And um, I would, of course, love to be there, okay? But I don't know if I'll be there for ISMB 2052. And many of the people in the audience might be up here at the podium, right? Hopefully, talking about some neat things they've done. And so we might think a little bit about what is our field going to look like in 2052. And so a few, a few thoughts on this. So one thought is that, you know, one thing we, we should not take for granted and that we should reflect on is that our field has been very special. And it's been special because it's powered by two amazing exponentials. And that is the exponential of computation, Moore's law, exponentially increasing computer speeds you know, year by year. And we have a, a similar exponential, which is unique to us, of DNA sequencing, exponential, even hyper exponential increases in the ability to sequence genomes year by year. Those are amazing, those are, the, those are the power, right? That powers our field forward. And it's, it's been very exciting for me, I can tell you, being part of those twin exponentials. And you might reflect to yourself, well, what is it gonna be like if the exponential growth doesn't continue? Well, I have here a picture from, this is Gattaca from 1997. 25 years later, okay, you might think about where we are there. Um, and here's 2001, A Space Odyssey. This was written around late 1960s. So what happened to space flight? About 50 years ago, we had, you know, first lunar landings, tremendous excitement. Well, people felt that by now we would long be on Jupiter. <laughs> we would be on Saturn. We would be beyond, but there's no exponential increase. This is the amount of space flights. This isn't exponential. This is a field that didn't have exponential growth. You might think about what that means. What does it mean for our field? Worth reflecting on. Another thing I'd like to reflect on is there's tremendous interest in the meeting, and I myself too, big data, deep learning, and all that type of stuff. And I think it is very exciting. But, you know, fundamentally, we're interested in a scientific discipline, which this is different from, you know, commercial data mining, ad mining, you know, stuff like that. 
we ha there's an underlying biological and physical model that describes the molecules that we're talking about, the people that we're talking about. And I really do think that one thing we should do as a field is think about bringing those two things together, bringing the, the deep learning, the very big models together with fundamental physical and biological understanding. And one thing I want to leave you to think about is weather forecasting. This is something I love. So weather forecasting was one of the first applications for the computer, 1950s, first thing they did, see if they could predict the weather, fluid flow patterns on the computer. Abject failure, but they discovered the butterfly effect, you know, the sensitivity to initial conditions. That's why weather forecasting didn't work. Terrible, you couldn't do anything. Couldn't even predict a few days in the future. But then, 1970s, 1980s, and beyond, large-scale data collection from satellites, balloons, all sorts of things. And then there's this fusion of that large-scale data with the physical modeling. And where we are today is it works, folks. You can pick up your iPhone. I did it every day. You look, what, how am I going to dress today? You look at it, and it works. It, it's not perfect. It gives you a probabilistic statistical prediction, but it's pretty accurate. And I think this fusion of physical modeling with large-scale data that they did for weather forecasting, I do think provides a vision for where we might want to go with biomedical data science. And actually, that does bring me to my next slide. What are we going to call our field? Are we going to call it, in 2052, are we going to call it computational biology? Are we going to call it bioinformatics? Are we going to call it biomedical data science or something else? And I, I talked about this a lot with my lab, and we made up a poll, which you can participate in if you want to at this little link here. Um, and I think it is interesting to think about. I, I'm, I'm curious myself. I have to say I'm more enthusiastic about this data science thing, you know, maybe renaming this thing, but, you know, that's for a lot of people to decide, is you can just look at the, the trends. This is a Google Trends analysis of that. Something to think about. And do please participate in our poll. We want to find out what the answer is. Okay, so I will summarize my talk today. I appreciate everyone's uh, staying to the end of the meeting and listening for this. Um, so let me tell you about um, what I told you. Uh, talks about today. So I gave you a little sense of kind of how, a little bit of how the field, but also my lab specifically has evolved. You know, I start out in the IS, second ISMB, you know, looking at structures, looking at motions, simulations. I got out of that, maybe stupidly, maybe smartly, who knows, but I got into networks and connectivity. And I got very into looking at the hubs and networks and how they were associated with constraint and biological networks, and then what would happen if we map uh, structures on them and how we got multi-interface, single interface hubs, and then I got into gene regulatory networks and looking at them as hierarchies and also comparing them to other hierarchical structures like that Linux call graph structure, which I think gives us a lot of intuition on why we, why we can make mutations in networks and biology doesn't. And then I also got a bit into just models for genome annotation, you know, predicting expression from promoter activity and so forth. And that's kind of the segue into where I am today to some degree. We're, we're still looking at these large-scale genomic data sets. We've talked a lot about NTEX, this beautiful data set that um, lets you look at allele-specific activity, which is the balanced activity or the imbalanced activity between the maternal and paternal chromosomes over many, over, over 1,500 different assays. And, you know, we can call these allelic events, and they really highlight places in the genome that are associated with disease, but I think more interestingly, they really let you get at what, what type of variants really disrupt binding and disrupt expression. And here we found the important idea was the sensitive transcription factors, the transcription factors that didn't um, heteroligamerize as much, that had more sensitive um, binding sites. And we could... We can see this very well because we have this transform model that really well predicts if a variant is um, going to give rise to allelic activity or not from looking at this, the nearby sequence context potentially of neighboring um, motifs. And then I sort of talked at the end just a little bit about the future. And, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about the digital phenotype and getting into that. I'm, I also think it's so important to think about biomedical privacy and how we can share and sanitize our data sets going forward. And then I think looking into the far future where I hope to be, but I don't know if I'll make it, and really thinking about will this, the twin exponential, you know, twin exponentials, will they continue to power our field or not? 
Um, so now I'm going to have some more acknowledgments. So now I haven't, I haven't, I've talked a lot about things, so I'm not going to acknowledge every single person, but for the NTAX, I'm going to give a more traditional acknowledgement. It's also kind of an interesting acknowledgement. So NTAX is a lot of people. This is a big science thing, 100 people involved in this thing, 20 labs, and actually it's kind of cool. You can, you can color the labs by what group they're part of, and you can see it's the kind of melding or the, <laughs> the, the breeding together, the, uh, the mating of two different consortia here. Uh, of course, orchestrated by one uh, central government agency. Okay. And in any case, you can see that. And I want to acknowledge particularly a lot of the, the key individuals that did the calculations here. Joel Rosofsky in my lab, J.O. Gao, a great graduate student in my lab, Timur Galiva, an associate research scientist lab, and Tin Xiao Li, um, a, a graduate student who really worked on that uh, transform model. And I also want to say, of course, if you want to be part of the, this group, do, do go to this website. We have lots of openings and stuff like that for people. And also, this is the website for all the tools and data from the N NTEX uh, project. And now I'll come back, of course, to my first slide where I have all the acknowledgments. And I want to also acknowledge the people that did not so much the present work on NTEX, but the earlier work um, that you heard about. So we heard a lot about the macromolecular motions from Werner Krebs and Sam Flores, really talented uh, students with me. We heard about uh, Dove Greenbaum, uh, Gamzi Gurzoy, and Arif Harmanchi, who were really uh, great students and postdocs, who got me into uh, genomic privacy and privacy in general. And we heard a lot from about work of Haiwan Yu, Philip Kim on uh, networks, also Dai Feng Wang on uh, looking at networks. These are all great students and postdocs who've now started independent research careers at these different um, institutes where they are. And also, uh, you heard about really good work from Chow Chang and Kevin Yip, who worked, um, really, really came up with all the ideas of these initial models for um, genomic activity relating the promoter to the, um, to the gene. Um, Chow is just a brilliant uh, person. And then we heard a little bit about work from Dan Spakovitz and also Jason Liu at getting into the wearables and so forth. And with that, I will thank you very much for your uh, attention. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh. It's been retrieved, we're good to go. All right, who's got a question? All right, Larry, you're nice and close. Cheated. Mark, that was brilliant and wonderful to watch. And uh, I wanna ask you about forecasting uh. um, because I think it's starting to happen, right? So COVID has really changed the way governments think about disease forecasting. Yep. Um, and they're really trying to put it together. And there's a variety of sources of information that get used, mostly electronic patient record and, and reporting of stuff to public health authorities, but a little bit in wastewater and airports and stuff like that. So tell us what it's going to take. And by the way, disease forecasting is terrible. We are in the 1950s. Yes. Okay, we cannot tell you what will come next. We have a hard enough time picking the strains of influenza for next year's, you know, uh, uh, vaccine. But so what are we going to need? What is, how is that going to evolve? Tell me how we get successful at disease forecasting. Well, I think, you know, I think, I, I don't know. Of course, if I did, I'd be talking about that now. Jeez, I don't know. But I, I do feel that the, the way forward with population level disease forecasting, but also individual disease forecasting really has to do with, you know, having a biological model of how the disease is transmitted, how the disease, you know, how COVID gets into us, how it influences us, you know, what, what it's doing with fusing it with big data we might get from the waste water management, from other public health sources, from genome sequencing and so forth. I, I do think that's very much our future. And, you know, I mean, I could easily imagine, you know, I hope to imagine, you know, opening my, I don't know if we call it an iPhone 20 years from now, but, you know, opening the thing and you're getting some forecast about my own personal health and also maybe the, the health of the environment I'm in that puts together a lot of information sources in some sort of model. You know, now they have these amazing maybe European model, the U.S. model for weather forecasting. And they're quite amazing. And I, I, maybe they'll have analogous models for population health and individual health. Oh, hello. Um, oh, right here. Ah, yeah. 
No, no. <laughs> Sorry, there's blinding light here. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was really great. Um, I, I was really interested in your discussion on privacy, especially. And um, so in our work, we do a lot of sequencing of uh, plasmodium and those come from human blood draws um so um but one of the challenges we upload all of our uh, all of our read data but before we do that for privacy reasons we do human read removal a consequence of that is always though that any 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 reads that are similar enough to the human genome will be removed so you will be removing informative reads so i'm really interested in how realistic you think it will be that we will get we'll, we'll be able to basically in the future produce um, sort of data and make it sort of freely available that is both anonymized but also doesn't remove things that are biologically important and how you know what 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 you think in terms of how realistic that is thank you well i, I think that's a good question and i i do think for environmental or for microbial sequencing or environmental sequencing there's a big issue you might know this from bycatch you know where there's there's additional sequences trawled in and i think this has become an increasingly big problem and I, I i mean my personal vision for things i mean i don't really have the answer but my one vision i have is that there's going to be many many tiers of levels i mean there's the ultimate raw data you know which we all want to get our hands on but will be i guess the fast cues and you know we'll have every single read but then there'll be varieties of sanitized data you know where, where you're describing one level of data sanitization which maybe degrades the data slightly but it's still quite usable maybe when we look at human data we'll have data sets shorn of all the common SNPs, shorn of all the rare SNPs. Maybe, maybe we can have some data sets that people are comfortable um, sharing if it just has common variants. Because common variants, it's very different sharing, com we all share common variants, right? We're, so people maybe are more comfortable sharing common variants than sharing rare variants. So I could see a situation where people might consent to uh, sharing common variants. We could have common, sh uh, common shared data sets. I, I don't know, but I, I, I'm imagining there's gonna be many tiers of access and a very, a, a somewhat complicated system. And of course, you all know, I mean, this is gonna depend so much on the, the nationality we're in, the, the country, the continent, and they're all gonna have different standards and it, it's gonna make it very complicated. And, but, I, but I think we have to think about, I mean, to do good science, we're obviously gonna have to grapple with that. All right, we are a little tight for time. We're gonna do one more from the online audience coming in from Terry Gasterland. Our goals as scientists are discovery and understanding. Although much of our field is biomedical, our investigations, sorry, someone just upvoted and it went out of order. <laughs> Although much of our field is biomedical, our investigations are broader and leverage unique and shared biological phenomena across many organisms and environments. Could you please comment on how your deep learning models can help extract understanding from discovery in the models you've pursued? Well, no, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I think that's a good question. I mean, obviously, we have lots of data in a more biomedical context, human data and so forth, but, you know, our ambition, and I say our, I mean people in the room in general, of course, would be to get at more fundamental models of you know, how a variant affects the binding of a factor, how a regulatory network is constructed. And I, I do really think that the, the value of the stuff that we develop is the, its level of generalizability. I mean, if you find something and it only applies in one particular system, it, you know, it's, it's of less value than if it generalizes. And one of the things that I found so exciting about network science was the, a lot of these ideas that were, say, developed in social networks or developed for neural networks, you could apply them for uh, molecular networks. You could apply them very broadly. And I think that the idea of this broad application beyond the, bi the, the medical or biomedical domain is I think something that we should highly value. And I, I fundamentally aspire to that. 